I now can sing since I've been redeemed. I'm on the everlasting, the everlasting rock. I faith in Christ, my Redeemer King. I'm on the everlasting, the everlasting rock. This is the voice of hope. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, hail thee as the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround the earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around the center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, blossoming meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou the Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, Lift us to the joy divine. Mortals, join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward. Victors in the midst of strife, joyful music lifts us onward in the triumph song of life. Thank you, men, for that wonderful song of praise. And by the way, that was the Shalom Quartet, and that song was a cut from their latest CD, simply titled Hymns. I recommend it to you. Thanks for joining me today for this edition of The Voice of Hope. I'm J. Mark Horst, your friend and Bible teacher. This program is produced by Heralds of Hope. We're an international media ministry sharing the good news of Jesus Christ around the world in English and 25 other languages. Some months ago, the pastor of one of our local Bible churches asked me to come and speak to his congregation. He's trying to instill in his people a deeper love for the Word of God and a greater commitment for service in the local church. It was a privilege to be able to do that, and that time of teaching became the basis for what I'll share with you today on this edition of The Voice of Hope. So stay with me for my teaching titled, The Inspired Word. I begin today by paying tribute to those who've so ably and graciously led me to embrace the discipline of biblical exposition. I'm deeply grateful to God for the nearly 30 years that I've been able to spend here at Heralds of Hope, and for the six years of mentoring that I received under the founder, Dr. J. Otis Yoder. He often reminded me in those days of the importance of being faithful to the Word. Biblical exposition is a discipline, and like any other discipline, there are practices and procedures that we must follow if we want to achieve accuracy and effectiveness when we handle the Word of God. Some of you listening to me are businessmen, and you're successful because you diligently follow proven principles of business. You dedicate a lot of time and effort to stay current with the latest developments in your particular field. And you do all of that so you can make your business profit and grow. But as I view the church through the lens of my own experience and my interaction with others, I'm afraid that we often fail to approach the Word of God with the same level of care and diligence. We do claim a high view of Scripture, 
but then too often we're haphazard in fulfilling the command to rightly divide the word of truth. And so the goal of my teaching today is to encourage a deeper love for the Word of God, a deeper commitment to obedience to it, and greater service to the local church. Now, whenever we study a portion of Scripture, we must look for the main ideas the writer wants us to grasp. And it's also important to note that whenever we examine a Scripture text, we mustn't do it in isolation. Every text appears in a wider context. Dr. J. Otis Yoder, who taught expository preaching to many pastors, was fond of this saying, a text without a context is a pretext. And so our text for today will be 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 14 to 17. My teaching will focus primarily on verses 16 and 17. So listen now as I read 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In this text, Paul informs us of several non-negotiable characteristics of the Word of God. How we embrace these characteristics will determine how well we're prepared for God's calling upon our lives to handle the Word of God with care and with authority. The first characteristic of the Scripture is, it is inspired. In verse 15, Paul reminds Timothy that he was taught from childhood from the Holy Scriptures. That would be the Old Testament. Timothy was instructed to continue studying those same Scriptures, and the result would be salvation through Jesus Christ. So the All Scripture of verse 16 refers primarily to the Old Testament, because that's all that Paul had at that time. But the statement leaves room for the later formation of the biblical canon. When Paul wrote this letter, some of his earlier letters were already in circulation. And then in 1 Corinthians 2.13, Paul claims divine inspiration for his writings as being taught by the Holy Spirit. And Peter endorses what Paul wrote this way, Just as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. That's 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Now I remind you, this subject of inspiration is a big one, and so we can only scratch the surface of it because we have two other characteristics of the word that we want to look at today. Do you believe the word of God is inspired or expired? Now, the reason I ask that question is because the word inspired causes us a bit of a problem. It comes from a Latin word that means to breathe in. We call that inhaling, right? I believe the ESV, the NIV, and others capture the meaning of this word better by translating theonoustos as God breathed. That is, to use the medical term, expired. It is exhaling. So, expiration is a more accurate way of stating what's meant by God breathed. But I can only imagine the response if this teaching were titled, The Expired Word. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, Moses writes about the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the deep. And the Hebrew word for spirit there is ruach. Many places, it's translated wind or breath. The effect of God breathing out in Genesis chapter 1 is the creation of life. And then in Genesis 2-7, God breathed out into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living, immortal soul. The Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uses the word pharaoh. So Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, that holy men of God spoke as they were moved 
Pharaoh by the Holy Spirit. The concept of inspiration gives divine approval to all the words of Scripture. All Scripture is so inspired by God that everything in it, its narratives, its prophecies, its citations, ideas, phrases, and words, all of those are such as God saw fit to be there. In 2 Timothy 1.13, Paul tells Timothy to retain the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me. So the very words of Scripture should be carefully guarded. Do you remember what Jesus said? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my ideas shall not pass away. No, that's not what he said. He said, my words shall not pass away. Apart from the words, there is no message and there is no inspiration. If you and I want to be fully equipped for every act of service, then we must embrace the inspiration of Scripture. The second characteristic of the word is, it is profitable. All Scripture is God-breathed and therefore useful. It was John Quincy Adams who said, I have for many years made it a practice to read through the Bible once a year. My custom is to read four or five chapters every morning immediately after rising from bed. It employs about an hour of my time, and it seems to me the most suitable manner of beginning the day. In whatever light we regard the Bible, whether with reference to revelation, to history, or to morality, it is an invaluable and inexhaustible mine of knowledge and virtue. And that's the end of his quote. The copy of Scripture that you hold in your hands is God's message to humanity. Because it is his message, it is profitable. That is, it is advantageous to you. It is helpful and it is useful. In our text, Paul outlines several ways in which it is useful, and we want to look at them. First, it is profitable for doctrine. The ESV and some others say profitable for teaching. Yes, that's correct. But teaching also speaks to the authority of the teacher. Why did the Holy Scriptures make Timothy wise unto salvation? Because the teaching was backed up by the authority of the teacher. If we were to turn to Romans 1.17, we would read what Paul wrote, that through the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. The teaching and the embrace of God's word develops our faith one step at a time. It was Augustine who said, Understanding is the reward of faith. Therefore, seek not to understand so that you may believe, but believe so that you may understand. That's a very important concept. Seek not to understand that you may believe, but believe that you may understand. Next, Paul says the word is profitable for reproof. That word means to cross-examine or to question someone for the purpose of convincing them. Now, if you're like me, I don't like to be reproved, and yet from time to time I need it. And this word is only used twice in the New Testament. It's used here and then again in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, and this might surprise you. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction or the evidence of things not seen. The Word of God convicts us. It rebukes us for our ungodly behavior or for the things that we believe that are false or inaccurate. It brings us to the point where we agree with God about what He says about us. Sometimes His reproof comes through reading the Word. Sometimes we hear it in a sermon, or maybe it's a word of counsel from a brother or sister. You know, truth can sometimes come to us from very unusual sources, and even from the lips of unbelievers. And then there's correction. It literally means to set right. In other words, it's bringing a restoration to the truth when there has been error. It is correcting one's faults. It includes the reformation of character and conduct. The Word of God, accepted and applied, is the only thing that can bring about true reformation. Several years ago, I was involved in a weekly Bible study at a facility for female juvenile offenders. And in one of our Bible studies, I took along a rose, and I showed it to the girls, and I asked them, what makes this rose 
arose? Why does it look like this? Why does it have this smell? And they gave a variety of answers, but eventually they realized that a rose is what it is because of its nature. It is what it was designed to be, and it has no power to change itself. So then I went farther and I asked them why we as human beings sin. And after some discussion, again they realized it's in our nature. It's who we are. And we have no power within us to effect lasting change. In order for our conduct to be corrected or set right, we need a new nature. And so no amount of self-effort or discipline or willpower will change who we are at the core of our being. Only Christ and the Word can set right what has been lost in the fall. We exchange our sin nature for the divine nature. And when the nature changes, then the behavior changes, because we begin to make choices out of that new nature. And then finally, the Word of God is advantageous for instruction in righteousness. It was Plato who said, Education is the constraining and directing of youth toward that right reason which the law affirms, and which the experience of the best of our elders has agreed to be truly right. In biblical usage, another meaning has come into this word which recognizes the necessity of correction or chastisement in discipline. It's used of God's chastisement by means of sorrow and evil. And this word is used in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, where fathers are commanded to nurture their children. That includes instruction by example, by warning, by kindness, and yes, by biblical discipline. You know, today many people want Jesus, the Savior, to provide forgiveness for their sin, but they don't want Jesus as Lord with his demands of discipleship and his instruction in righteousness. But you know, that's not the way God designed the plan of salvation. Genuine conversion is the birth process of discipleship, and so spiritual growth and development must follow. God's Word meets our deepest needs. It transforms us from the inside out. People need God's Word more than they need our observations and even our practical suggestions. And sure, there are times to make practical application and to give counsel. I've done some of that, and I will continue to do that. But we must distinguish between the good stuff and God's stuff. If you're involved in ministry to people, give them God's stuff. God breathed scripture because God's word is profitable. And then the final characteristic of the word that we look at today is, it is sufficient. The London Baptist Confession of 1677 proclaims, and I'm quoting now, The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. The whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for his own glory, man's salvation, faith, and life is either expressly set down or necessarily contained in the Holy Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added whether by new revelation of the Spirit or by the traditions of men. And that's the end of the quote. Just prior to our text, Paul warned Timothy that deception will increase as we approach the end of the age. We see that today, don't we? Too many professing Christ followers are being tossed about with every wind of doctrine. Why? Because they have not embraced the sufficiency of the word. If they truly believed that the word was sufficient, it would affect their daily choices. It would affect the way they live. Paul's teaching here convinces me that the word of God must be the measure of all things. We live in an age of information overload, don't we? But all the information we receive must be held up to the divine plumb line or measurement of Holy Scripture. Because the Scripture alone is sufficient to meet the needs of fallen humanity. Whatever problem or need you or I may have, whatever situation or circumstance we face, whatever besetting sin or addiction that binds us, the Word of God is sufficient to set people free. And when the Scriptures don't address an area specifically, then we can ask the Holy Spirit to give us light 
and understanding. As a young man, I recall a situation in our church not specifically addressed in the Word. Our leaders called a meeting of the membership to discuss the issue, and we didn't get very far in that discussion until we realized that we weren't all in agreement. So our leaders wisely called us to search the Scriptures, to fast, and to pray. And then some weeks later, another meeting was convened, and the unity evident in that meeting proved that God heard our prayers and brought us together in a way that was not humanly possible. Our text says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Incidentally, the word man is anthropos. That's a human being. So God needs men and women who are fully equipped for every good work. What does it mean to be completely equipped? It means competent, sufficient, completely qualified, having special aptitude for given uses. This is what happens when we implement the other characteristics in this text into our daily lives. And even though we can't see it in our English text, Paul here uses two forms of the Greek word for equip, an adjective and a participle, in order to make his point. So we could say the man or woman of God is super equipped by the Word of God. You know, that's a wonderful thought to me, super equipped by the Scriptures. John Stott wrote, Scripture is the chief means which God employs to bring the man of God to maturity. Completeness speaks of a harmonious combination of different qualities and abilities that allows God's purposes to be fulfilled in you and me. As Christ followers, we are ambassadors for Christ. We've been given a solemn charge, an awesome responsibility, and I might add, an incredible privilege. If you and I truly believe that the Word is God-breathed, then we will find it advantageous in every area of our lives. And as we submit ourselves to the Word, we will find ourselves fully equipped to do every good work. So, will you renew your commitment to these characteristics of the Scripture? Will you demonstrate by your life and ministry that the Word is inspired, profitable, and sufficient? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above Echoes of mercy, whispers of love This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long This is my story, this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And where does that blessed assurance come from? It comes from our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And the only authoritative place I know that you can go to learn about that relationship 
is in the pages of Holy Scripture. I hope today's teaching has encouraged you. I don't believe we can overemphasize the value and the importance of God's Word. It is under attack today like never before. Paul wrote these words of warning to Timothy. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. We are obviously living in those times. Now if you'd like to review this teaching or share it with someone, you can request a copy. It's available either in print or as a digital audio file. Just ask for it by its title, The Inspired Word. And if you have a comment or suggestion about the program, feel free to reach out with those too. The easiest way for you to contact us is to use our email address, hope at heraldsofhope.org. That's hope at heraldsofhope.org. Or call us toll free at 866 866- Nine six zero zero two nine two, or mail your request to the Voice of Hope, Box Three, Breezewood, Pennsylvania, one five five three three. To review today's program or to listen to archived programs, log on to our website, heraldsofhope.org, and you can listen when it's convenient for you. And while you're on the site, you can subscribe to our newsletter our blog posts, or even purchase resources. So check out heraldsofhope.org. To help this ministry financially, you can send a check by mail or donate securely online at our website, heraldsofhope.org. You can also call our toll-free number, 866-960-0292, to donate via credit or debit card. God's grace, accompanied by your fervent prayers, and your generous financial support will enable the voice of hope to be on the air until Jesus comes in the air. Now don't forget to join me next week for the voice of hope. Lord willing, we'll begin a new series of study from the Gospel of Mark. And until we meet again, rejoice in God's care. Under his wings I'm safely abiding Though the night deepens and tempests are wild, still I can trust him, I know he will keep me. He has redeemed me and I am his child. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever. Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Under his wings what a refuge in sorrow, how the heart yearningly turns to his rest. Often when earth has no balm for my healing, there I find comfort and there I am blessed. Under his wings, under his wings, who from his love can sever? Under his wings my soul shall abide, Safely abide forever. Under his wings, oh, what precious enjoyment there will.